Good morning. Well, Tonya, have you managed to stay away from your purchases? So, did you I, go and pick it up? I did go to pick it up, and apparently UPS has started delivering packages at just, like, other random sites. And so when I went there, the guy didn't have my stuff. So I had to submit a complaint. Yeah, I'm, like, really upset. So I think once this is resolved... Um, I think I'm not going to order anything else until this pandemic situation is done because that's just mm. insane. So I don't have them. I'm really, really disappointed. Yeah, that's a large amount of money to have <laughs> sitting in the around, postal service. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they didn't even send it to like another postal service. They found like a bodega and just dropped it there. And apparently this has been happening to other people. So the post office oh. told me I needed to check there and the guy wasn't even surprised. He took me where he had other packages and there was like a pile of them, but none of them were mine. So I was like, wow, this is insane. Mm -hmm. So yeah, hopefully I'll get them. If not, I will get my money. <laughs> well, I feel like the Raspberry Pi will be fine, but the Synology is pretty sensitive. They just like throwing that around in the back of trucks. And I know, right? And that's what I really need. That's what I wanted to set up this weekend was to get that going. Yeah. Man, you're going to have such a good time when you get it. It's it's such a pleasure to work with. It's so easy to use. Um, I could go on and on. I, I hope you I hope you like it. If you have any questions, I love talking about those things. Sure, sure, I will. Now, did you change your location? Because this looks like it's a whole it's different around. direction. Yeah, I was like, it looks longer rather than... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got done and I was like, I, for, for some reason, as we've been doing classes, I've just been accumulating a massive mess because I've just been focusing on other things and, and keeping, keeping up to speed with you guys. So yesterday I just cleaned everything all day long and I was like, oh, I'm just going to move my tables and get a fresh, fresh perspective. Yeah, that's awesome. I love cleaning. I don't know why but I just love cleaning and organizing stuff. And yeah. <laughs> See, I, I'd have really bad habits about cleaning. I get to a point where it starts to bug me and then I just, everything must be clean. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I can't do that. I need to, <laughs> I need to do that. I can't. <laughs> I think that's how you're supposed to do it. I don't think you're supposed to do what I do, but. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you all don't mind. <laughs> yeah, my wife puts up with it barely. morning everybody happy sunday everybody have a good saturday anybody do anything cool yesterday other than clean If everybody just clean, that's that's cool too. I'm not saying it's uncool to clean. Just... 
farmer's market. What'd you get at farmer's market? Um, so it's peach season. All the local peaches are out. And I love the donut peaches. They have regular um, donut peaches and then they have like a yellow variety. Um, and they're really good. And so I got that and some tomatoes and, you know, there's more and more organic farmers and stuff at the market these days. So that's good. And I haven't gone very much over the last year and a half. So yesterday I'm like, I can go for peaches. I just, I just need some fresh peaches. I've never heard of a donut peach before. Oh, they're delicious. They're delicious. And the, they're, 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 they're short. So it's like, you just take one bite all the way around instead of like having like this whole gooey, juicy mess in your hand mm -hmm. as you try to eat it. it it's, it's much more civilized. <laughs> so it's, it's actually a species of, of peach. It's not like peaches that have been left on the ground and gravity is. No, no, it's its own variety. Um, oh, they're, wow. uh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, we're pretty lucky. We got we got a lot of fruits here. You can get fresh at the market. They have a lot of different varieties of cherries and apples and pears. I got mm. some red clap pears and stuff like that too. Um, wait, they, wait, wait! You're throwing out words I've never heard before. Radcliffe pear, red clap pears. They they red just have a nice deep red um, color on the outside. Uh, rather than, you know, like the Bosch green pears that you see at the store. Mm. A red pear, I've never had a red pear before. I've had a Bosch pear before. The brown ones, I've never had a red pear. Mm -mm. Over here in Montana, we get a lot of cherries from Washington and apples and all that sort of stuff, but um, so Syracuse has a pretty, pretty big farmer's market. Oh yeah. It's the biggest in the Northeast. Um, oh yeah, no, it's like, uh, there's five buildings. And then, um, during the summer, they also fill like two sort of rows of parking lots in between the buildings. It's, mm. it's huge. Um, yeah, but yeah, all around the Syracuse area, there's a lot of like Wayne counties and some of them really big, uh, farming, especially apples, lots of apples, mm. but, uh, all the other fruits too. I get it. When you're known for something, that's where the guilt comes in. You're known for something and you don't go and partake. Yeah. It's the same, same thing for here. We have really good skiing and I never skied for like the first three years I moved here. And so everybody made fun. It's this guilt that accumulates. <laughs> okay. Um, I, the only thing that I was going to talk about today is uh, generating free SSL certificates. Um, and spoiler alert, it's really, really easy. Um, so I figured that will probably go towards the end of the hour. Um, let's start off with any questions about, I know uh, a number of you have dug into the homework um, and have questions about uh, authentication authorization. So let's dig in there. And then after that, I'll open it up to any questions you have and then um, and then I'll close with the SSL certs. Sound good? All right, who's first? Questions about authorization and authentication. Uh, so this is Latonia, and this is kind of a housekeeping question. Um, so when I first went in, I ran uh, the install for Auth0 in the mm -hmm. wrong place. Uh, and so I, I bought, since then I've redone it because I found an article that said there are specific uh, cases where you would want to run it more than once. Like if you have a separate set of users, maybe or something, you would run it for the different you know apps that you're using. But I was wondering, do I need to uninstall it from where I ran it the first time? Um, it's up to you. Do you recall, I think it was the first week I taught with all of you, do you remember Shaw running into an issue where he had node modules up above where he was running his code? Does anybody yeah. remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
that's the only situation I could think of where you might get into trouble is you've installed something up above where you're at and when you run code in your folder, you accidentally pick up some of those node modules from above you. So it's not really it's not really a big problem, but with SHA, we ran into that issue and it was kind of a head scratcher because I think Ryan actually was the one to point out that that was that was going on. I never would have even guessed it. So that's the only that's the only thing I could think of that would be a, a detractor from not okay. cleaning those up. And I sent you a Slack and I sent you a screenshot because after I did that, I did my PWD and my LS and I'm checking mm -hmm. through a Slack and I noticed there's this Node file with some package JSON, JSON files. And I was like, I don't mm -hmm. think we go here. So I sent the message to you and Max and Max was like, yeah, they definitely need to go. So um, yeah, I, so that's in your home directory. Um, it's probably a, a good idea to chop those three three things out. If you if you run an npm install in a folder that you don't intend for it to to have those packages, it's going to generate. I thought all it generated was the node modules and the package lock. I but Wait, if it generates the package.json, you just nuke it all. So you're Just nuke it all. Does that, okay. does that make sense? Yeah, so I don't have to. I'm sorry, I started the video of you if you if you all heard that word sound that was Nathan talking in class. Um, so I don't need to run anything in terminal though. All I have to do is just paint those those files that came up in there and yep. I'm all good. Okay, thank you. Other questions about the, the homework? Is everybody doing okay on it? So I'll go again, <laughs> this is Latonia. So I, I started my homework this morning. Then when I had that issue, I stopped because I didn't want to break things completely. Um, so now that I know, I, I just got to the point where I'm adding in the domain. But I found again that when I um, set up my application, you know how we did the whole step, the single page, I did all of that. I saved and it's gone again. So I don't know what's going on. Oh, um, uh, can you share your screen really quick? Yeah, hold on. It's a mess, folks. So I'm just trying not to That's fine. judge me. Before we get into into what's going on with Latonia, um, so where... does anybody want to take a guess at what could be going wrong here? Why things might appear to be dropping out? So I went into, it was application, application, and I mm -hmm. set up a tenant, but I, I did the tenant afterwards because I must have missed that when we did it in class, but still I set up a tenant. And that's, I'm that's my guess. So up in, the, up in the top where it says create a scrape portal, yeah. you switch tenant. Oh, oh. So, so it's saying I'm in the one that I want to be in though. This is and and I'm guessing that the other one the dev OJ5, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's where you're gonna see, if you click on that, I'm guessing that's where you're gonna see the rest of your applications. It's good practice to make a tenant for each app that you're working on. So yeah, like Latonia's got one for, for, for the web store example that we did. Um, so go ahead and click into applications. Oh. Yeah, it's right there. So can I move this over or do I just need to delete stuff in? It's a good question. If you click those ellipses, yeah. Does it let you uh, go to set it? Yeah. Scroll, I, if it's gonna be anywhere, I'm guessing it's gonna be at the very bottom where the um, scary settings are. 
Yeah, if I have to redo yeah. mine, that's so weird. Did that happen? Okay. Well, just Great. just for the class. Mm -hmm. Just for the class, let's just write a, an application really quick. So if you switch to your tenant that, um, and, and actually before you switch, do you want to go ahead and delete this one just to make sure we don't accidentally yeah. pick it up? Let me just copy that real quick. Okay. And then just delete. <laughs> nice, you knew that it was going to ask you for I it. I really didn't, but knew it. <laughs> Okay, and I'm going to come back and delete these. Should we keep the defaults? Is that something we need? I, I don't know if you could delete it, but it's it comes with it. I never I never recommend using it. I'm j okay. I just leave it alone. Okay, so I'll leave that one. But once I'm done with my homework, I plan to, to delete this one. No offense to you, of course. Oh, okay. no, it's fine. So switch tenant. Is the portal the front end for the back end? Is the what? The, yep, the front, the back front end. Yep. Got it. And it said to, um, this going to be the endpoint, and I wanted the endpoint to say portal, so that's why I picked that name. Yep. Okay. I noticed that you did like the very, very top, and I kind of didn't want to be confused about what it was doing. Um, okay, so I'm going to application. Application. Create. Stop me, because I'm talking like I know what I'm doing. No, this is, you're doing everything right. Single. Okay. Yeah. Oh, did I need to pick one of those? You said only if we need help, right? Nope. Okay. Only, yep, only if you if you need an extra guide to, to get you through. Um, yeah. Yep, here we go. Yep, exactly. I don't remember doing anything else in here, but I'm going to go back and put my logo in. Okay, so that's all set. And then, um, okay, so then I just go to the terminal, right? And I go through the steps of install. Plug in. Yep, and then just plug in the values into your auth to your provider. Yep. Okay, all right, um, thank you. For and then if you want, if you click on that connections tab, I don't know if you still were interested in doing username password managed by auth zero but if you just wanted the google sign in this is where you would uncheck things and um, these Wait. are all the different connections oh say that again so what i was trying to do is set it up where it has the github and linkedin like i wanted a solid three options mm -hmm. for people and i wasn't able to figure that out and i know that kelly showed us um how to get there so i was just going to go back through the video um but I guess I'm confused about what you're saying that this button does. So, so blow up the screen real quick. Um, make this window full size so you can see the. Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to actually make it bigger. Is that okay? There we go. So over over on the left, there's that authentication section. If you click on that and click on social, here's where you can create all the different connections. So if you click on create connection. I think for oh. things like LinkedIn, you mm -hmm. need to include some details. So if you click oh. on that LinkedIn card. Okay. Uh, okay, so it will walk you through, but okay. the flow is that you go to this authentication social, you go here and you create all the different possible connections that you want your app to use. And then once you've created them here in this section, you go back to the application, back to the connections, and then you toggle them on and off based on what you want that that thing okay. to use. That's very helpful because what I did is I, I went in and there's a place where you can you can customize your your look. And I, I'm not seeing it right now. The branding. If you click on branding, yep. Yeah. And so I went in here and I made all kinds of changes. And I was expecting to see that other stuff we just did in there. So that was my my mistake. I was just confused about where I needed to be. Um, yeah, this is this is for exactly this is for uploading the logo, changing the the login page, um, how it looks and how it behaves. But as far as the connections that hydrate and go on to that login box, that's all through the um, that authentication. Okay. And, and let me 
let me just throw out something. There is differences with how Auth0 behaves depending on whether or not you use their, uh, if you click on settings, that settings tab and go back to the, yep. If you switch to using the uh, classic or you switch to using the HTML, so you switch and toggle that button and then you start changing the HTML, the actual code that goes in that. If you do that, there are some slight differences like the get access token silently call. Do you guys remember that call that we made to get, there's some differences. I know if you, if you customize that page, some of those calls will change a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so just be just be careful, I guess, if you switch off of the the new and use the classic or modify it, um, some of those things will behave a little bit differently. Okay. Do you recommend we make changes? And it almost sounds like you're saying it could be more more trouble than it's worth. Depending well, on. I'll just throw out my own example. I tried to customize it at density, and I tried to customize it at um, my current company, and both times it's it's made the Auth0 SDK, that provider and all the code that you use in your, in your React app, it's, it, it's required little tweaks in order to work. If you just use their unified, what it comes built with, everything just seems to work fine, but you just gotta put in a little bit of extra effort, um, which isn't a bad thing if you, if you really wanna customize it. I'm just saying, it's not, it's not like you just press the button and it works. Um, there, there are a couple little things you have to do. I wish I could, I wish I had written them down, but I, I haven't. Um, I, I think it has to do with that get access token silently. Okay. I have one last question. I, I went in here yeah. and I was like changing stuff and I must have done it in the other, is it called tenant? I, I did it in the other place because I had like branded stuff in here. Um, but then it just wouldn't let me actually change stuff. Like this one looks different because the other one mm -hmm. had a whole section of stuff commented out. And I was trying to figure out like how, like even something as simple as like what the message says, like enter your password or your new password versus just, you know, new password here or whatever. I'm just trying to do like a basic example. Um, but this looks really different from the other one I was I was working with. So yeah, because I was, you've switched off of unified to the, to the classic in order to edit this HTML, you have to flip off of the unified. Oh, but I did take it off before we, because I didn't save, so it should have kept the same. It's fine. It's fine. I can I can look at it later. Um, that way some other folks can go. But that was very helpful. Thank you so much. That way I don't think I'm crazy. I was like, how is this stuff just popping away? Other questions, thoughts, capstone issues? This is your time, so nothing is off limits. Hi, Nathan. I had a um, question I was thinking about um, that uh, I maybe we went over it in class and my head was just a little too full to absorb it. But um, sure. we talk about how to make sure like so we went through the third party authorization signing in through Google or whatever account. But did we 
put how did we go over how to put limits on that like for mine where I only want to use it as an admin thing like how do I make sure I'm the only one signing in through Google like someone else just says oh yeah I'll sign in through Google to add stuff to your website mm -hmm. um how, how do I limit the my to just me like who can use that right We didn't cover that, um, mainly because mainly because what I want people to feel comfortable with is kind of the traditional, we've got e-commerce, we need folks to log in and place orders, that sort of thing. The floodgates are open, anyone and everyone is welcome. For your case, I can think of two different ways to do it. Um, the first and kind of what seems like the most obvious solution is you remember how we pass that access token to the back end and we protect our endpoints using that access token. One thing that you can do is after your endpoint, well, sorry, there's there's a lot of options when I think about it. Recall that the access token, we can add permissions to it. Do you remember in class us adding permissions to users that have signed up on the website? And then we use a, a piece of middleware called check permissions. Do you recall the check permissions middleware? If not, don't feel like you need to go look it up. I can pull it up in like 10 seconds. Do you recall the check permissions? I honestly am not remembering it at this moment, but I can just go back no worries. to the video. Nope, nope, that's what, that's what I'm here for. Please don't feel like you have to go and watch the video. Um, okay, let's get a new terminal open. Let me pull up that code. So it's the back end web store. And let's open up. Let's go there. Yeah, I believe it was Wednesday. We kind of went over a lot of stuff and there was, so this middleware, I would assume most people are familiar with. This is the check jot middleware. And all it's doing is it's ensuring that when the user sends an access token from the front end to the back end, no matter who they are, this is just verifying that it was issued from our auth zero domain. Um, it's not been tampered with, it's valid that that whole sort of thing. But then there was another, another piece of middleware that we talked about, which was, um, let me dig up the example for it. Actually, I think it's on GitHub. Let's look. Also, now. Nope. Yep, here we go. So this code. So there's another piece of middleware called check permissions that uses the other library that we installed this jot auth z. And this behaves just like this behaves just like check JWT. So you would take this, come down to where your endpoint is that you want to protect. So like this items, let's say that we only want admins to be able to hit the items endpoint. It's not enough to just use the access token. Although the access token is kind of the foundation, we want to start off by requiring users to be authenticated, have an identity. We want to start off with that. But if you add the check permissions middleware, and check permissions takes a list of permissions that you want to require on that endpoint. So if we wanted to make an, a permission called um, admin, um, usually, usually these permissions take the form of a verb colon noun. So it would be something like, 
uh, manage admin. Although there's nothing stopping you from calling the permission just plain admin, but Auth0 wants you to put it in this sort of um, scheme. So let's call let's call the permission manage admin. So then what you would do is you would go to Auth0. Log in. Okay, go to your tenant. Go to your APIs. So we're talking about the back end. We're not talking about the front end. We're talking about the, the back end um, that we've wired up in Auth0. So you would go to your back end, and then here are the permissions. So you can define your own custom permissions here on this page. So we'll create a permission called manage admin. I'm just give it a description. Permission required to manage the app. And we'll hit add. So all this is doing is declaring that this, this application, this API has a permission called manage admin. And now that it's up here in Auth0, Whatever users have signed in, so yourself, if you're the only admin, you can go and hit assign permissions. So select your backend and then toggle the manage admin. So that's one way to do it. And I think that's kind of the cleanest way because Brielle, if you had other admins, all you would need to do is go in here and give them the, the admin permission. Um, the only drawback, well, let me stop there. Does that, does that make sense? Is that um, so? Let me go ahead and let me push up that code so it's up on Nathan's web store because it's not really it's really not that bad. It's just defining this piece of middleware, and that's that's about it. So let me go ahead and save and push that up. Um, Okay, so that's up on Nathan's backend store. So if you look at the, oops. Oh, merge conflicts, man. Oh, merge conflicts am I gonna get with code that I wrote myself? So for all the folks that are seeing what I'm doing on screen, if you are making changes and you're trying to merge them into GitHub and um, let's say that the code isn't necessarily in sync, you'll get what are known as merge conflicts. And there are these funky lines. And all this is is Git is saying that um, your main had something, you had something else, and we have no idea how to get those two things to reconcile. So you need to go and fix it by hand. That's that's what I'm doing here. Um, we want this one. We want that one. There we go. There we go. So now we've got a commit up here, and all it is is. Um, the code for that middleware. So if you go and click into app.js, that's the middleware we're talking about, this check permissions middleware. And then to use it would be something like this. OK. So but there, I want to say there is there is a drawback to this. So in order to give someone a permission in Auth0, they first need to sign into your app. 
So Auth0 needs to see them and create a user for them in Auth0 before you can attach a permission to them. So that's kind of the drawback is, uh, so Brielle, let's say that you have a, a co-founder that you want to work with and you want to give them admin. So what you would say is go log into the app and then ping me on Slack and I'll give you the permission. So it's kind of this weird, um, go do something and then let me know when you've done it and I'll go give you the permission. The alternative to, to that is recall that we get the access token and we can exchange the access token on the user info endpoint for information about who owns that access token. If you wanted to, you could just make a, a list in your code, in your node server that says only people with these email addresses have access to these endpoints. And you could verify that by looking at your listing code of all the emails that belong to admins. Um, so take the access token, exchange it for user info details, look them up in the list. Are they part of the admin list? If so, cool, you get access to these endpoints. Otherwise, um, otherwise you don't. Um, so that would be another kind of easy way to manage that. The only downside to that would be whenever you want to add someone to the admin list, you would need to make a new deploy of your app because you'd have to change that list and all of a sudden you're kicking out a deploy. I think the, the third and final solution I'll, I'll give you is you could put all this in the database. So instead of making a list of users as a Node.js variable, you could just have a table in Postgres called admin users and it's just a list of emails. So you can take the access token, exchange it for their um, for their user attributes, check to see if they belong in the admin table. If so, then they have access to the endpoint. Any one of those, any one of those um, different avenues will work. I really think I like the first way with the permissions. That makes the most sense to me. I think I'll, I'll uh, try to set that up. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely the most the most streamlined. I think. Um, yeah, the only kind of annoying bit is saying, "Hey, go log in and then give me a message when you're." Um, but I mean, it's a. It's also nice because somebody that's not technical necessarily could also do the same thing in Auth zero and do it on your on your behalf. They don't need to know about your database table, your variables, or any of that kind of stuff. So, I I like it too. Good question. Um, I kind of, I kind of assume that folks remembered how to exchange an access token for user details. Would anybody like to see that again? Do folks still remember how that works? I'd be so happy to see share my Yeah. Okay. Let me share. Let me share my screen again because we kind of went over this pretty quickly. Um, so let's say that you don't want to use, uh, well, let's, let's say you want their email address. That's kind of one of the most basic reasons for why you would want to, want to do this. So let's say we have this endpoint that's CheckJot. Now CheckJot is, requires an access token to be passed in and CheckJot is gonna ensure that the access token is valid, that it um, hasn't been tampered with and then it was issued by the Auth0 domain that the backend is expecting. But after that, the access token really isn't too useful. It's only really useful for uh, checking permissions. Um, but after that, the only other thing you can really do with it is you can take it and exchange it for user details. So to exchange an access token for information about the user that's calling your endpoint, we first need to get the access token. And to get the access token, recall that the request variable represents the data coming from the user. It's the call that they're making into your backend. And recall that, that when the front end is making calls to the backend, we do it with a header. So if we go and look at Nathan's web store, so we go and look at the front end. Uh, 
oh, man, my code is all kinds of screwed up. Um, Did I not push up code for the front end to make authenticated calls to the back end? No, this is still going to my unauthenticated. Oh, this this branch, maybe? This branch? Nope. Okay, well, I'll get, we'll, we'll write the code for it now. Okay, so let's go check out that branch. Could have swore I pushed this up after class. So when we get the access token for the user in the front end, after they've logged in, we call this get access token silently. And then we set a piece of React state. So we hold on to that token. After we've done that, then we authenticate all of our calls from the front end to the back end by setting a header. And that header looks like this. It's authorization is the key. And then the value is bearer. And then whatever the token, the access token is. So whenever the front end is making calls to an endpoint that's protected by that check jot middleware, we have to send in an authorization token. So once we've sent that access token, we need to pull it out on the back end. We need to have it in that endpoint so we can exchange it for user information. So in order to pull this out, what the front end is sending to the back end, so if we go back here, if we want to get the access token out, we take the requests, we look at the headers, and then we get the authorization header. So this is going to get, if I pull this up side by side with the front end code, this is going to get the value here. So we're reading that out on the back end. So we're taking the, the access token that the front end sent, and we're reading it back out on the back end and we're snagging it and we're putting it into this box called access token. Does that make sense? So once the backend has access to the access token, we can exchange it for information about the user because if we just print out the access token, let's do that. And I'll go run the front end. I'll go to the back end and start that up as well. So it's port. Oh, we have a .emv. Am I using it? No, this code isn't using it. Okay. Auth zero has already been declared. upset because I've defined this twice. I'll get rid of the old one. Oh, this was all of our example code from Thursday. There we go. Now we're running. Go to the front end, we'll log in. All right, now we're making a call to the back end. And we're getting undefined for the access token. So let's check here in the front end and make sure that we're sending it like we expect. So we're making a call to the items endpoint. Let's see what is contained in it. Load this up. Let's look at headers. So we're definitely passing a valid access token to the back end. Request.headers authorization. 
let's just console log out. Can I spell that right? Authorization. Let's console log the headers. We run. Refresh. Here we go. So we have an under, oh, so it's not capitalized. That is strange. Because our authorization header being sent has a capital A, but for some reason on the back end, it lower cases the key in the, in the headers map. Okay, so we'll just grab the under the lowercase a authorization header. This should give us the access token. Start and stop my server. Refresh. Oops, it's not console log everything. Let's just console log the access token. Refresh. There we go. So now we're snagging the access token. We're reading it out on the back end. Any questions? So if we take the access token and we go and inspect it, so go to that website, jot.io, paste it in here, take a look at it. You can see that we have two different audiences. We have one that is our backend, represents our backend. And then we have another one, a user info endpoint. So the audience means what does this, ac this access token have access to? What is it authorized to talk to? Well, it's authorized to talk to our backend, but it's also authorized to talk to our auth0 user info endpoint. And what you would do is you would take this endpoint, which isn't going to change. It's always the same after you've configured your Auth0 application. So you just need to do this one time in order to go and figure out what this endpoint is. But you take that endpoint, go back into your code, and using your favorite HTTP library, you would make a get to that endpoint, and you would pass it the same header that you read out from the uh, from the client making the call. So we would say headers authorization and then pass it the value of that access token. So you're making a call to the user info endpoint with the access token that the user made the request with. And this is going to return some user details. And because axios.get returns a promise, we need to make sure we do an await here. And because we're using await, we need to make sure we have the async keyword in our function. But after that's all said and done, we can console.log the user details. Get rid of that. Okay. Restart your server. I'm going to go back into my front end, refresh. Axios is not defined, so let's npm install save Axios. Run again, refresh again. Oh, Axios is not defined, not because I haven't installed it, but because I haven't included it. So that's going to create the require line, refresh, refresh. There we go. Now we have an object with a data attribute. So what we should do is instead of just printing out, so here, instead of just printing out user details, we should continue the promise take a D and return the D.data. We just want the data attribute that Axios returns. You guys have seen this before, so I'll restart that. Rerun the back end. There we go. Now we've got an object that represents the user. So this, this uh, Brielle, this would be where you could snoop the email 
And if you had something as basic as uh, const admin emails equals Nathan at gmail. .com. So you could do something as low tech as this. Snoop out what the email address is, and then up here in your endpoint, do something like if uh, user details, or sorry, if admin emails dot contain dot includes, that's the right word. So if the array admin emails includes our user details email, then we know it's an admin and we can do something else if they're not part of that, we could do something like send uh, this is I, I definitely like the auth zero approach of adding a permission. Um, but again, this is just in, in case you wanted to go the super low tech, manage a whole bunch of code. Uh, for no good reason uh, approach. Um, let me, I'm going to, I think my code examples are kind of in a, in a scramble after we did um, all those questions on Thursday. So I think all of this is in a pretty good state because we're running it right now. Let me, um, let me commit all of this and push it up so you have the latest and it's sitting on GitHub. So latest known good working configuration. So there's the back end. And then let's update the front end. Local back end and send authorized header. Okay, so now both of these repos, Nathan's back end store in Nathan's web store have the code, except for auth zero is on the branch. Let's create a pull request to merge that in. Of course it has merge conflicts. Uh, we, can, we can do this. Um, We've got a merge conflict in index, and we've got a merge conflict in. Let's fix this really quick. Oh, holy moly. Uh, oh, gosh, this is a bad one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's just take what Auth0 branch has for truth. Yeah, now the code is up to date. So the Nathan's Web Store has the latest example, and so does the backend store. Sorry about that. I thought that I had pushed up the latest examples after class, um, and I apparently hadn't pushed up enough code. So this has an example of how to use the check permissions. This has an example of how to fetch user details. Um, and then the front end, we go and look at app.js. This has an example of how to make a authenticated request from the front end to the back end using the authorization header. So this piece is really important when you add that check jot middleware to all of your endpoints because you need to provide proof that the front end is who they say they are. The user logged in is who they say they are. Um, any questions? I don't have any questions about that specifically, but um, the the merge conflict stuff has been making me think, um, and I'm wondering, 
I'm um, just kind of throwing this out there. If other people might be interested in like a uh, lesson, maybe like after the program is over or something like that in how to do, I guess you were calling it social GitHub. Social um, Like with multiple people contributing to the same code or whatever. Um, I don't know if maybe it could be like rolled into a women in coding event or just like a, like a uh, reunion of the people who have been in this cohort or whatever. Um, and if a bunch of us are interested, maybe somebody would be willing to teach it. I don't know, um, but I would definitely be interested. And women, yeah, Brian. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, women in coding doesn't mean you can't be a woman to go. True. Yeah. Thanks Ryan for saying that, so I didn't have to. Ryan, Ryan Goss has a, a immense passion for talking about Git, and I think he does a fantastic job of explaining it. I take the approach of, uh, like, it. I don't feel like things will stick until you have a reason to figure stuff out, like, especially on the job. Like, part of your job will be, you need to get your code merged. And so for me, that's when concepts really stick. I think Ryan would be an excellent teacher if you guys wanted somebody to, to show you that. Um, I mean, we have like, we could use some project that we've done in the course, like the the uh, vacation thing that we did in React or the, the appliance uh, app, you know, something that we kind of all worked on together. And mainly the code was like the teacher's code, but we could all do variations on it and try to push it up or whatever. I don't know. Actually, I, I think I think it would be fun. Do you guys want to do like a 15 minute experiment? Okay, because I can show you SSL certificates. Uh, it's going to be really short. Um, let, so let's do an experiment. I'm going to show you all a merge conflict, your very first merge conflict. Um, and it's it doesn't require a huge setup. It really doesn't require a lot of uh, an existing code base or anything like that. All we need to do if we want to we want to learn how to do the very most basic of of social Git. All we need to do is we go to GitHub and we create a new repo and we call it names. Uh, we'll, we'll make it public. We'll start off with a readme in it. So everybody go to github.com forward slash deluxe forward slash names in your browser. I need, I need like everybody in Zoom to do this in order for this exercise to work because we're, we're, we're about to bungle some stuff. So once you go there, make sure you grab the HTTPS URL and clone down this repo. So you would say something like, I'm going to use SSH, but you, you grab the HTTPS version. You go somewhere on your computer and say, get clone and pass it the name. Once you've, pulled, once you've pulled it down, pull again on origin trunk. I'm sorry, I use trunk for my, my branch name. I know you're used to main. I know you're used to master. I call mine trunk. So get pull origin trunk once you've cloned it down. And you should get a file that has, uh, has my name in it inside of a, a, a file called names.txt. I'm sorry, what was the second thing we're supposed to do again? So go in, once you've cloned it down, do a git pull origin trunk. Okay, thanks. And you should, you should see a names.txt in there. You have to go into the names folder first, right? Not the folder where you cloned that it. Okay. There is a, you should have a folder called names when you clone it. So go into that and then you should see a names.txt and all it should have is my name in it. Yeah. 
Nathan, I'm sorry, I'm starting to get confused. <laughs> I have the folder, I'm in it in my terminal. Am I running this get pull origin trunk or am I going into the actual folder to do something? Um, you should just run get pull origin trunk. Yeah. Do you see a names file in that folder now? Oh, okay. Get. See mine when I ran it at the level where I installed the, where I did the clone, it said that um, could not find remote ref trunk. And then I went into the names folder and it said mm -hmm. already up to date. So I guess I didn't need to do that pull. Yeah, if you, if you pulled after I committed this, then, or sorry, if you okay. cloned after I created the file, um, yeah, it should already be there. Um, but just remember when you clone something, it's gonna clone that file into wherever you called the clone command. You have to CD into the, the folder, the, the repo in order to, to use git commands. So does everybody see a names.txt inside of their Git repo? No, I, I don't. I have what Kyle just said she has, where it says I'm already up to date. Are you saying we need to reclone it? No, if, if you see a names.txt in that folder, you're good to go. Just do ls. Oh, I thought I had done that. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. You see it? <laughs> yes. Okay. I didn't, I didn't go yes. into the, to look in. Thank you. So I got uh, two people. A anybody else? We need like we need the, everybody in here to to make this example work. I'm sorry, I was running a little behind you guys. So I I cloned it and I'm in the folder. What did you want me to do next? If you do an ls, do you see a names.txt? Yes. Cool. You're all set. You're up, up okay. To where we are. I thought there was more. Thanks. Kelly, are you, can you help out as well? Yeah, I'm there. Cool. Let's go. All right. Dominique, Phobelia. Brandy. Zoom user. So apparently this is how cohort one was run. Is that correct, Kelly? Do you mean like go to a repo and good luck? <laughs> is that just like everybody who pushed to the same repo on the same branch? Yeah, yeah. We had a uh, careers in code code base that was just like a separate GitHub project. And that was how we were supposed to do all of our homework was everybody upload and in like individual folders in this one repo. And you can imagine exactly how much of a mess that was. So did the individual folders help at all or was it still this contention for everybody trying to push and? Both things. Okay. Uh, the individual folders helped uh, with people who had kind of like a better sense of Git. You know, some of us were able to use the individual folders and that worked just fine. Um, and then other people had a bit more trouble like navigating between folders or understanding like this folder has your name on it, please only push your code to this folder mm -hmm. and don't go in other people's folders and start trying to push up code because your name's not in there. So don't go there. Um, I have to say though, I was glad for the experience. Um, it helped me when I got to my first job, you know, that I had already seen Git, had had to learn how to like what a merge conflict is, and, you know, mm -hmm. how to like pull things down and clone. And the more Git practice you can do, the better. It's always what I recommend. I actually have a question for you, Nathan. Um, do you yeah. only do Git in the command line or have you used like a GUI for Git? I've only ever done it in the command line. Okay. Gotcha. Because I'm pretty big on like command line Git. That's all I've done too. But someone recommended source tree to me as like a visual way to do Git. And I haven't checked it out yet, but I thought it was kind of neat. So I'll drop a link in the chat if anybody else is kind of interested in like a GUI for Git. 
Yeah, I, I still stand by the thought that using the command line forces you to know more, but you know, the like even even the PyCharm, even WebStorm, they come with annotate so you could do blames uh, in the code that you're looking at. So, um, I mean, I'm not hardline against using a GUI at all for Git, but, um, and especially when it gets really nasty, but even when it gets really nasty, I don't trust the GUI tools because I don't trust them to like safely navigate me out of whatever situation I'm in. Um, never too good to zip up and reclone and try it all again by hand. Never ever too good. If you can't do it with Git, you can oh, definitely man. do it with some drag and drop. Mm -hmm. Reclone, number one tip. <laughs> yep. Never be afraid never to reclone. Never too good. <laughs> mm -hmm. no, you're never too good. Okay, so we're gonna. That we're supposed to be creating a folder with our name in it or something? No, 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 no. no. So what we're gonna do next is we're all going to add our name to the names.txt. So go ahead and edit that file, make a commit so you bundle up your changes, and then hold hold there. Don't push, um, don't push yet. Just make add your name into the list next to mine. Save, make a commit, describe your changes, and then just just wait there. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to add another name. I'm going to join in the fun. Nathan Evans, John Smith. You said we can hit enter after we, uh, for the commit, right? I mean, you can put anything you want. For my commit, I'm going to say add in my, my name. Right, but were we waiting to hit commit or were, are we hitting commit? Okay, thank no, you. No, go ahead and commit. Go ahead and make the commit, but don't don't run the push just yet. All right, once everybody's committed, give me a thumbs up and let me know. And we'll move on to the, to the train wreck we're about to create. Um, so why do I keep, I keep sounding disparaging. Why do th people think we're about to hit a train wreck. Can anybody int intuit why we're about to make a real mess? I know like one of those race conditions you were talking about the other day. Whoever gets there first is gonna- Yeah, that's a- The code- that's a, that's a really good example. Yeah, we've got a bunch of different people trying to push up a bunch of different names in this file. What would we expect the output to be? Who's going to win? Should you be getting quote after you hit enter? Um, you just just do your commit um, like like so. So get commit dash am and yeah, that's what I did. Quote. And I'm doing it from the oh maybe I'm doing it from inside the file. Let me look. No, that's where you are. I'm at the same place and, and I've done it twice now and it's giving me that quote, which I know is an error thing. And I try control C too. So I may, I just may not be in the. Oh, you're still in a quote? It's uh, once I hit enter, when I try to do my commit, that's mm -hmm. when it turns back that, you know how instead of having my directory. It does that? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, just make sure you have a closing quote. So hit control C and make sure you close the quote. Huh, I did. I have an open and a closing one. Maybe I'll that try double you, quote at a single. Do you, yeah, okay. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah, if you use quotes inside of your message, then that can also kind of mess with it. So like added Nathan's name. So notice how I'm using a quote inside my message. If you do that, you need to be careful and use um, use different quotes to surround it. So we couldn't do something like that where we have three single quotes. 
It's probably my apostrophe in my name now that you say that. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Good, good catch. Yeah, that always, that always gets me. Okay, now that we've got commits, let's push. So everybody to do a push, um, because I use special branch names, it's going to be git push origin trunk, not main, not master, but git push origin trunk. I'm going to hit it first so I get in. So my push, my push worked. I got a permission denied to BA Daily. That's correct. Oh, this is a, ah, oh, right. This is a, even though it's public, you guys haven't been added. Ah, dang. I thought this was going to be easy. Do we, we need to, only you can contribute, manage. Mm. Is there a way to just make this completely open? It is visible. Oh gosh. All right, start giving me give me some emails. Or actually just give me your uh, your GitHub username if you can recall what that is. If you drop in the Slack, I'll add you to this repo real quick. To find out what your GitHub chat? username is. Yeah, put it in chat. To find out what it is, you would go to github.com, click on your username, and um, there we go. Added. 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 And I think you'll get an email that you have to click on. And... Yep, so I sent everybody invitations to click on those in your email and accept. Kelly's already accepted. Kyle just accepted. Tonya just accepted. Brielle, Mel, and are you guys able to see the invite in your? Mel got it. Uh, Dominic, did you put your um, email in chat? Or sorry, your GitHub username in chat? I'll send you an invite. Once we accept the invitation, should we try pushing again or are we waiting? Uh, I think we're about to get one more contributor. Let me okay. invite Dominique. Invites, invites. 
All right, Dominique, I sent you uh, an invite, so if you can accept it in your email. Dominique, do you have a commit ready? Did you add your name to the names.txt? I did not. I took a bathroom break and I'm behind. So actually, oh. um, yeah, I'll just follow along then. Thank you. Okay. Uh huh. Um, okay, so everybody's in. Uh, let's all push. So get push origin trunk. Hopefully you don't get a 403 this time. It looks like it worked. It says it was rejected because I don't have some stuff locally. Is that what we're supposed to see? Is is anybody else getting the same rejected? Failed to push refs. All right. Yep. So welcome to the traffic traffic deadlock uh, world of social Git. So master has moved. I have pushed the latest. So I am now the source of truth. Uh, so what you must do is fight amongst yourselves to push. Um, that could be either through communicating between each other or you can um, just all blindly keep trying to push. But here's the process. So trunk has moved. So what you need to do is you need to get pull origin trunk. So you get the latest changes. That will bring you up to date. Anybody got a merge conflict yet? Merge conflicts, do we have merge conflicts? <laughs> oh boy, here we go, okay. So um, actually let's let's have somebody guide. Uh, Brielle, do you mind being the, no, you can't share your screen, right? I, no, I joined from the right computer today. I can share my screen. <laughs> awesome, will you share your screen and show us the process of, let me stop sharing, there we go. Uh, um, well, the other participants, there we go. So let me make that a lot bigger, right? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, can you open up the names.txt? Um, I will admit I went through Visual Code because I'm still not super comfortable with the terminal. What's the command to open the txt again? Um, just say open space names.txt. Oh, what am I typing? Cool. Oh, Brielle, you put your name. Oh, fancy. All right. So yeah. this merge conflict shows what changes you have locally and what master has. So you need to reconcile the two of them. So in order to do that, you can see that there's Nathan Evans, your name, and then John Smith. So mm -hmm. you, as the developer, need to reconcile this merge conflict. How would you go about doing that? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, is what is this uh, line? So it's a marker. So everything between the line that says head and the equals signs. Mm -hmm. All of that is what you have in your local Git repo. Mm -hmm. Everything after that, after the equal sign and up to where you have highlighted is mm -hmm. what GitHub has. Okay. So, so those markers are really just for your reference to know what you have locally and then what GitHub is saying that it has pushed up um, on GitHub. So your job is to take out those markers. So the DD6, that whole line, and the head marker, and you're okay. supposed to make this. So I can I literally just because they're what would have happened if they were on the same line? Like it, it wouldn't that? have put it on the same line. No, okay. So is this Those, all it takes? Yep. If that's if that's what you think it should look like, because you're actually rewriting 
you're, you're creating a new commit when you're doing this. You're making changes. You're reconciling the two pieces of, of, of state. So if this looks right to you, then that's, you've resolved your first merge conflict. That seemed too easy. <laughs> it's going to get really tricky for the rest of people. You got lucky because you're the first one here. Um, okay, so let's save. Hit so save just and... like, all right, so just control S, so you, right? That's all I did. And then. Yep, that's all you did. Now go back into the terminal. And this is how you resolve a merge conflict. So merge conflicts are a little, a little weird. If you do a git status, let's take a look at right. what's going on with the terminal. Okay, so see how it says there's this unmerged path. You've got a merge conflict on names.txt. Yes. Okay, to resolve the merge conflict, once you're done and once you're happy with everything, you say git commit dash A. Notice how we're not going to give it an M. We're not going to give it a message because this is a merge conflict that contains its own message. So we'll hit enter. All right, now it's going to drop you into Vim. Have folks heard, heard of Vim, the text editor Vim? Maybe. This is a, this is a terminal text used editor. It, yeah, we might have used it once when we were doing the Git ignore file, the universal Git ignore file, or global, I'm sorry, global Git ignore. So you're, you're actually in a text editor right now. In order to leave the text editor, you would, you would very carefully on your keyboard press the escape. Okay. Press, press shift and then the colon. Okay, so. Okay, now see down in the bottom, you, your cursor's moved down to the bottom. You've got a little colon marker there. Uh-huh. Now say, this is where you can enter in commands. So now enter in the command, the letter W, Q, hit enter. Just You've successfully resolved the merge conflict. Now you can push. So okay, so uh, uh, or push yep, margin. That exact commit. Yep. Wow! Thank you, everybody else in class, for not trying to uh, push ahead. Um, cool. You're done. You got your name into the file. If you go to GitHub.com, um, your name is now entered in there along with mine and John Smith's. Okay. Um, Stop share. So, what was that? WQ? What does that mean? The sequence is escape colon WQ enter. That was just to get out of the um, the Vim text editor. Okay. I didn't yep. know because it was several different commands that you were still doing that. Cool. Yep. Thank you, Kelly. That's exactly. All right. Who's next? Because you, you guys are all in, in deadlock with each other. So you've got your names locally on your computer, but except for me and Brielle, everybody else still needs to push theirs up. So so we should all pull again then, right? Should, yep, because the remote has changed again. So do another pull. Still bungled. Polling is not possible because you have unmerged files. Oh, right, because we're all still back on the original merge conflict. Yeah. Yep, this is Git. Um, so let's think. Um, so you can resolve the merge conflict here where you are at, but this is resolving the merge conflict with an older uh, version of main, an older version of, of history. So we could resolve this merge conflict, the merge conflicts that everyone has. But then when you go to push it, you're going to find out that you're still behind because Brielle just pushed up a commit. So then you'll pull again and you'll get another merge conflict. So the easiest thing to do here is going to be to reset. So to do a reset, to do a reset, you say git reset dash dash hard in the terminal. And that will reset everything that you've been doing. And you could successfully pull again and get another merge conflict. Okay, but that's going to take my name out that I 
put in, right? Which, I mean, doesn't matter for this exercise, but if this was real code, I'd want to back up my code first. No, since you've already committed, you have a commit locally, Git reset oh. will not wipe that commit out. It will just wipe out everything that you currently don't have committed. So all of your staged and unstaged changes. Okay. So if folks do a git reset dash dash hard and then do another poll, um, you should see a merge conflict where the merge conflict is now with Brielle because Brielle was added to main. Kelly, are you able to see that? So I'm actually running into a different issue entirely. Um, I have a message that says support for password authentication was removed on August 13th. Please use a personal access token instead. So I have to do just some updating on my uh, GitHub. Are you using are you using SSH keys? Um, I did. I had a, a username and password saved for a long time. And then I kept getting emails like GitHub is no longer supporting passwords. Change it. Mm -hmm. And then I did a bad thing and didn't update anything. I was just like, nah, I won't worry about it. And now all of a sudden it's like, no password. Use personal did you, access but did you ever Did you ever create an SSH key and do the whole SSH ad and... Have you seen that? I don't think so. Maybe, maybe that's not what I did. I know like a long time ago when I first started using it, I put in my username and password and it's just kind of rolled through the whole yeah. time. Yeah, okay. So. Has, any, has, has anybody else been able to pull and get a merge conflict with Brielle? Latonia, you've got one. Okay, I so you're so. gonna I didn't say her name anywhere, or would I just have to open the file? Open up the file and check it out. You should have a merge conflict. You should see those funky markers in that file. Are you seeing it, Kyle? Yep. Okay. So we're we're in the same situation again, where really only one person can go at a time, unless folks want to resolve multiple merge conflicts. This is this can be where we stop because I hope the point has kind of kind of come across at this point. Um, if and this is where the social get part starts to come into play. You wouldn't do this on the job ever, 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 ever. Because what we do instead of contributing, everybody contributing to the same branch, and like we just ran into in this example where we're all pushing to the same file, we're all trying to make changes within the same thing. That is realistic. A lot of developers may be working on the same file, like uh, like our backend. Maybe folks are writing new endpoints, so we're all adding to our server or our app.js. So that's very realistic. But what we haven't talked about is branches. We've talked about main, we've talked about master, we've talked about trunk, we've talked about this concept of there being this one thing that we always push to. That thing is actually a branch. And what developers do is they create branches and then they merge those branches together because when you create pull requests, you do it using branches. You compare main to what you're working on and you take these snapshots and you work on your own branch and merge those together into whatever the main branch is, main, master, trunk, whatever you want to call it. Um, this is in a nutshell though, what merge conflicts look like. It produces those funky markers, get, can't figure out what you're trying to do. So you have to go in and manually resolve that yourself. And when you run into a merge conflict, um, don't forget the escape colon WQ enter. That is how you, once you finish resolving the merge conflict, that's how you um, save the merge conflict and push it up. Any questions? It's just a taste. I, I don't claim to be a, a real good teacher of Git, but that's a merge conflict in a nutshell. So how does that work with the different branches then? Like what? Yeah. You just coordinate so amongst you. yourselves who's going to push when and how, like, because if you all have different code, say you're all working on a different, everybody's working on a different endpoint. You don't want to race the endpoint that somebody else already pushed to the main trunk or branch or whatever, or um, master, whatever you're calling it when you're adding your endpoint. Oh, Latonia, you got close, but this marker shouldn't be in there. That's just a that's just a helpful guide that Git adds for you so you can see what the changes are inside the file. Uh, but, act, but other than that, great job, because you, you resolved the merge conflict um, 
correctly. So, um, so sorry, Kyle, I got got distracted. Were you interested in seeing a branching example? Sure. Yeah. If okay. you have one that you can show, it's not. Oh, totally. So um, let me fix the merge conflict drop head marker. Okay, so notice how we've all been working off this branch called trunk. And in your repo, your Capso repo, you call it main or master. Just think of those as being synonymous with, it's the main branch. It's the primary one that shows up on GitHub when you go and visit the page. To create a branch, you would say git checkout dash b and then give it a name. So I'm going to say uh, adding um, favorite color. So this is going to be my branch name. And in my terminal, I've switched from being on the trunk branch to now I'm on the favorite color branch, which means that wherever wherever trunk was at that point of time, it's like a tree. I've now diverged off onto my own branch, my own uh, leaf, my own branch going off of that tree. So now what I can do is I can do all the same stuff. I can add um, my favorite color, which is, I don't know, orange. And I can make a commit and I can say favorite color for Nathan is orange. And I can do a git push origin. But since I'm not on the trunk branch, I'm on my own branch off of that tree. Instead of pushing directly to trunk, instead of pushing to main, instead of pushing directly to master, I'm going to push my branch. OK, and then GitHub will pop up this link for you after you've pushed a, a new branch. And I'll ask you if you want to create a pull request. You know, click into that. And then this is where the pull request deal starts to pop up. And I mean, I see this every day at work. Uh, so you'll get really used to making pull requests because this is how you contribute code. So let's say I want to get Latonia to approve my changes. I'll go ahead and request her as a reviewer to make sure that I've spelled my favorite color correctly. I'll open the pull request. I could provide, I should provide a description of the changes I made, but I feel like this one's pretty self-apparent. Um, I'll politely ask Latonia, will you come and check out my pull request and verify that I've added my favorite color? So Latonia will come in here, she'll click on files changed. Git will show what the change is that I'm proposing. So I'm proposing that we add the word, the pipe character and the word orange on line one. Okay. And Latonia, if you come into this pull request, you should have very nice. You're natural at this. So then we can hit merge pull request. Confirm merge. So we've merged this into the main branch trunk. So now if we go and look back at the GitHub repo, we'll see that there's a merge for the pull request. The inside here is orange. So that's the right way to do this. And if we had started off doing that, we probably would have still had merge conflicts, but not nearly as bad as, as what we ran into. So if you folks want to try taking a stab at opening up a pull request, um, the process is from the main branch, so I'm going to go back to trunk. So you'll start off on the trunk branch and then to create a new branch off of whatever you're currently on. So you should be on trunk. To create a new branch, you would say git checkout dash B and give it a name. Should we reset first because there's changes? Latonia's name is in there now and the color. If you have state, if you have changes that you've made or you're in the middle of resolving a merge conflict, yeah, do a git reset. Okay. Latonia, I think you've already added your name. Can you make a pull request to add your favorite color to your name? Yeah, I was just doing that now. So am I doing just like you did? I, I just go in, I do the git checkout. I'm calling it favorite color, do my pipe and stuff and go ahead. Yep, exactly. Thanks. 
Just remember that Git checkout, if you're creating a new branch, you would use the dash B that specifies that you're creating a new branch. If you want to just check out an existing branch like trunk, you would just say Git checkout trunk. Git checkout moves you between branches locally in your repo. So can I just go back to when you were on the GitHub web page, though? Um, did it, mm -hmm. it automatically, after Latonia approved it, it automatically went to the main branch? Is that? Um, I went in and hit the merge button. So there was a button down here. Oh, OK. Approved on it. the GitHub website that you merge it at. OK. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Don't have to do anything in the command line. I'm still getting a merge conflict when I pull the names.txt in the main trunk. So go ahead. Go ahead and resolve it. I did the hard reset thing. And then after I did that, it said auto merging names that text conflict, merge conflict and names that text automatic merge failed, fix conflicts and then commit the result. Yeah, so you'll probably, you'll still need to, to you'll Did still you do another need to reset and conflict. another pull. No, don't do a reset, fix the merge conflict. So go into the file correct it so it has your name, doesn't have those conflict markers in it. If you want to share your screen, that might be helpful. Yeah, sure. Where's the button? Where's that? Cool. This? Yep, so see how you've got these markers? So. Right. Ooh, this is a good one. Also notice that you're going to have to do a little thinking here because you see you have an old copy of Nathan Evans without the orange color. Well, and then I have so, you here too. Yep. And then you have me there. So again, everything between, color. yep, everything between head and the equal sign is what you have on your computer. Everything after the equal sign and the funky greater than symbols below is what github has so you've got to make sure so that you intelligently i want to keep your name there yep and then get rid of this and put myself on the bottom and then oh yeah that's a that's a good move and then put a color for me too i guess cool so All you've right. saved it. Now we need to finish resolving the merge conflict. So this isn't a normal commit. This is a special merge conflict commit. So you do git commit dash A, no message. Okay. okay. And, and dash, dash A is... Uh, oh, whoops. <laughs> no worries. At least make typos. That thing that Max says when people are watching you type, you can't type properly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a space after the T on that commit. Oh. All right. Great. There we go. So just like git commit dash AM, except. Uh, right. Yep. <laughs> it's just dash A. Okay. Special. That's what I meant to type. It just wasn't coming out right. <laughs> special git command, or sorry, special bin commands. Right. So and escape. This one is in the chat somewhere. Yep. Escape. And then let go of escape, and then you do the other. Mm -hmm. Colon. Okay. Am I even? There we go. Escape and then. Oh, I escaped the cheat. Okay, you're gonna have to tell me again. Colon W Q. Is escape. that right? Escape. Just press escape one more time. You yeah, can press I escaped the chat thing. I closed the chat when I did that. <laughs> okay. Now shift and then the colon character. Shift and then colon. Mm -hmm. Okay, WQ that's showing it. It. and then WQ. Okay. There we go. Now you push. And I want to push. But the before you push, color, right? Right. You got to remember to push the branch. You're not pushing trunk anymore. So or push origin, and then like that. I haven't created that yet, but you've created it on GitHub, so it doesn't matter. No, I haven't created the branch. Have you not created a favorite color branch? No, I haven't. Okay, no worries. So go ahead and back up. This is fine if you have a commit already on, uh, already saved. So do a git checkout dash B, so you're gonna create a brand new branch. 
And then I think other people might have already taken- favorite color here, right? Yep, that would be the name of your branch, but go ahead and call it favorite color dash Kyle. Because oh. um, branch names can't, we don't want them to collide. So if someone's already taken the favorite color branch, we don't want you to accidentally use it. So, okay, go ahead and hit enter. So you're going to switch to that branch if you do a get status. Okay. Notice that it's saying on branch favorite color, Kyle. So you've moved off of trunk, you're on your own. Okay, it moves you automatically. Range. All right. Yep. So now you can do your push. Okay. Got a handy dandy little link that will take you to a pull request. So go ahead and click. Um, no, nope, sorry, the link up above. Yep, that one. Yep. Can't cool. merge. Okay. That's okay. Go ahead and um, request me as a reviewer because you want somebody else to review your pull request. So up at the top right where it's suggesting Latonia, click mm -hmm. the gear. Okay. Type in or just click on deluxe. Click on you. Yeah. Okay. And then you can create the pull request. Congratulations. If you click on files change, that little tab for files changed, you can see what you're actually changing. Change. So click, go up to the top, mm -hmm. click on files changed. See the tab, commits, checks, oh, files changed, there you go. Okay. Oh, it thinks I removed and added John Smith. That's interesting. Because I moved the lines up. I think it might be a new line character that it's getting tripped up on, but it's functionally equivalent, right? Right, because the, the if the red wasn't there, it would be correct. So yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, let's click back onto the conversation or you can hit back so, that works too. Yeah. All right, so you've got another merge conflict. So scroll down. So Git isn't going to be able to merge this because you still have a conflict on names.txt. So go back into the terminal. We need to resolve the merge conflict here. So to resolve the merge conflict on your branch, you would say git pull origin trunk. Something in trunk is. So we've got a merge conflict again. So let's, yep. Who did this one? Who made this merge conflict? We'll soon find out. <laughs> Mel, Mel, <laughs> pushing the trunk and not making pull requests. Oh, man. Okay, so go ahead and resolve this one. Okay. Kyle, you're going to get a lot of practice in resolving this. This is good. This is what I wanted. <laughs> Great. Okay. Okay. Save. And now let me see if I can remember. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Open that file back up. I think I spotted something. I'm in there twice now with both a color and without a color. Oh, because this is from Mel's code, right. Thank you. OK. Hang on. That look great to everybody. With Git, with Git we, can, we can find, oh, Mel. I've, Mel, you added me, me in. Yeah, it was. Uh, so that's the cool part about Git is that it tracks what everyone does. So you, there's actually a command called Git blame where you can get your pitchfork out and find who did what. <laughs> so uh, that's why I'm picking on Mel because I can see, I can see who did what. Um, okay, so you you've successfully that's completed it. So go ahead and seeing that he ran yep. there twice again. All right. So now let's see what was the next uh, step is. Um, Get, do I need to do git commit dash a or do I need to? It's a special yeah. merge conflict, so you use the special commit. Right, I think that was right. Is that right? Perfect, yep. Yep. All right. 
and then escape. Yep. And colon WQ. Okay. And, and now, now am I pushing which trunk? Am I pushing to the trunk or the I think I pulled from the trunk when I got that, right? You did because you're getting your branch ready to merge into trunk, but you're not going to push the trunk anymore. You're going to push to, to just your branch and you're going to let GitHub manage merging your branch into trunk. So now let's right. push. But did you branch. approve Mel's changes? Is that how that got to the trunk or? He, he pushed directly to Trunk instead of making a pull request. That's why you're having to deal with another merge conflict is because Trunk okay. moved while you were on this branch. Okay. But you've resolved it. So now we yeah. can go ahead and yeah. push. Okay. So I am still pushing to my own branch. So it's um, right. Get push origin favorite. Now, if we go back to the, yep, the screen. Moving around us, around yep. <laughs> yep. Web browser here. So you could, you could see if you scroll up a little bit oh. more, okay. there's a new commit that was added. Um, Three there, or files changed. Yep. Yeah, either one, if you want, we can look at either one of those. Yep, so see you've added two minutes ago, you added that additional merge, merge commit. And now if you go to files this is changed. You approved, and this is the current one, right? I haven't approved anything yet. So oh, if you go okay. and click on files changed, I'll go in there as That's well. That's like a merge request, not an actual merge. Exactly, exactly. Okay. It's a merge commit. You've you've fixed a, a conflict. So if we go and look at files changed, you've fixed the Nathan Evans up at the top, and then you've added yourself above. Why is Mel? Oh no, Mel's down here now. Okay. So it looks good to me if you go back to conversation. I've already approved it. Uh, conversation. Okay, it so says zero. Yeah. All right. So scroll down and then to I the need bottom. To back to the terminal. No, I need to put nope. a button somewhere here, right? Yep. Now you're ready to merge. So you've gotten approval. Merge you can click that, that button. Yep. Hit confirm merge. Uh, is my description right? Nope. Nope. Just leave it. Just leave it. Okay. Because I didn't have a chance to add a description that it was Mel's name and color. Okay. There cool. we go. Now your code is in, in trunk. So if you go and click the, on the How do you get names. back to like seeing the actual code? I guess I could just yep, pull it go, in, right? No, no. In GitHub, click on the repo name. So deluxe names up the top. Oh, up here. Okay. I'm getting so now it because we have more name. layers than normal. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, cool. Yep. Nice. And now if we go on the history. This is everybody. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Train wreck 101. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Anybody have questions? I know this is just a uh, smattering of info, but this is kind of what Kelly and I do every day. So <laughs> you, it's so real though. Just like this is good to show. The the takeaway is that in all of careers in code, we've been pushing to that one special branch. Mm -hmm. And in your day to day as a professional software developer, you really won't see that. Folks won't be pushing directly to trunk master or main. Um, instead, they'll make pull requests, so you'll branch off of those, you'll make these pull requests, you'll tag people to take a look at it and give you feedback and critique, because if you go back to that pull request you open, you'll notice that you can, you can add all kinds of discussion. So click, uh, Kyle, click on the pull request. I'm still sharing. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you want me to go back? Nope, you're good. Yep. I mean, share my screen again? Okay. No, so did click you up on the pull requests tab up at the top next to code and issues. Okay. Yep, that one. And then click on the closed. So we're going to look at some of the older pull requests. So, yep, that one right there. So these are all the closed ones. Click on favorite color, Kyle. That was your PR. Okay. So 
There's a comment box down below. So if you scroll down a little bit more, you can leave comments on the pull request saying, yeah, this looks good, or um, I'm gonna test this this afternoon. So you can leave a message for the person that wrote the pull request. You can also, if you go back- I believe this is your favorite on, color. <laughs> yeah, yeah, prove it to me. Where are the unit tests? Um, if you scroll back up to the top though, you can actually leave comments on lines of code. So if you click on oh. the files change tab, Scroll okay. back up. Yep. Files changed. Okay. And then, so maybe I disagree with you that your favorite color is purple. So see where on line six, if you go and hover over line six, um, move Wait. your mouse down a little bit more. Oh, this line six. See, this is confusing because the green line six, not the red or the yeah, white. Because line. we're adding, right? Okay. Um, right. So I'm hovering over normally, it. I had a click, but yeah, plus, okay. Oh yeah, that's that's the plus, yep, click that. So okay. you can leave a comment on this line. So go ahead and say uh, something like, my favorite color is actually indigo. I don't know. Color is now blue. <laughs> <laughs> and Start then the add point. single comment. The Start to review, you can do this whole deal, but if you just add single comment, Okay, exclamation point. There we go. Mm -hmm. So now you can leave helpful little hints on here. So when folks come and read your pull request and they're curious about different changes, like why did you use let instead of const on this line? Or um, okay. why are you committing an API key on this line? So people can leave you these kind of comments and you can come back and address your code and push more commits. And it's kind of that back and forth that you see every day on the job. This is kind of backwards because we've already merged it. People don't usually leave you comments after we've merged it, but if the pull request is open, this is the sort of stuff you'd be doing. Okay, we've gone for almost two hours. Um, do folks want to, are, does anybody have any questions, I guess, about that sort of stuff? I know it's a lot of stuff, you don't need to grok it. Uh, please pester Ryan to give you like a proper academic Here's how Git works, because um, he's extremely good at it. Um, but Thanks. also, don't that sweat was actually it. Don't... Kind of fun. <laughs> I know it won't be it, fun it in is. real life, but <laughs> it, it is. It is a lot of fun because you're you're communicating changes with other people. You're working with other folks, but also don't sweat it too much because I'm I'm positive that your colleagues at whatever company you start working for will be more than happy to help help you learn some of this stuff. Um, and if they aren't, then they're probably not the kind of people that you want to work with anyway. So don't, just don't, don't sweat, uh, don't sweat this. Cause some places have different requirements. Like at companies I've worked at, um, it was the wild west. We made pull requests as a show of faith, uh, good faith. At some places it was literally a requirement in order to do business that we had people reviewing code. So um, different places have different requirements. So uh, don't feel like you need to to get all of this in, in one. I don't. I just wanted to have some idea of how it worked. And um, yeah, I actually, one of my mock job interviews, they, uh, the person asked me um, about that. And I basically just said that I only, we've only been using it to back up our code and that I was aware that there was such a thing, um, but I didn't really mm -hmm. know anything about it. So now I feel like I could answer that question a little bit. <laughs> cool. Cool. Other questions, thoughts, concerns? Cool. Well, I'm, I think I'm going to ditch the SSL certs. I think if you really want to get free SSL search, just give me a holler. I'm always going to be in the Hackout State Slack for until they kick me out. Um, if you if you really want a free SSL cert, I'm more than happy to show you show you how to do that. But Heroku gives you one automatically. Um, it's not it's not something that you you necessarily have to do yourself. So with that, I'm going to give you guys back whatever time we may have left. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Good luck next week with Anissa. I'm sure that you're going to learn a ton about web security. Um, 
and good luck on your capstone. If you have any questions about the homework, any questions about uh, deployments or just Node.js stuff or whatever, I'm obviously going to be around. Same, same for Kelly. We're both going to be around um, while you guys finish up your capstone and we'll be available for any questions you might have. All right, Kelly, you have anything you want to you want to say other than? Um, sure, just real quick, I will say thanks again. I've had an absolute blast this past week. I'm really glad I came back. And it's really cool to see how much everybody's grown and developed over the past few months in their code journey. So that feels really good. Um, thank you to everyone for mentioning women in coding. If you're interested in that, I'm happy to give you more information. You don't have to be a woman to come to the meetings. Um, so feel free to show up if you want to, that'd be rad. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of your presentations at graduation. I'm really excited for it. So awesome job, cohort two. Awesome. All right, we'll see you later. Have a great rest of your day. Uh, Brielle, are we, do you want to meet? Do you still want to meet? I think you're muted. You are muted. You are muted. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, I do. Cool. I usually am slightly more stubborn about just pushing through and learning the hard way, but graduation is getting closer. So if I could have a little extra help that might save me a couple hours of staring down videos. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what I'm here for. Um, can you give me five minutes? I'll shoot you a Google Hangout link. Perfect. Uh, thanks. Cool. See you in five.